my mum always wanted me to be a primary school teacher. I just couldn't face the thought. Not because I didn't want to teach, but I was terrified to stand in front of people and teach. And um, but when it became standing in front of teaching people in Greece, it all of a sudden became a different, you know, I really wanted to do it. I wasn't any more confident, wasn't any more brave, but I really wanted to go and live that life. So I'm here with Jennifer McKenzie. Uh, how, how are you doing today, Jennifer? Good, good, good. Good doing. Um, it's, it's, it had to happen. We had to have you on for the finale of this series because it was only fair, given that we had uh, Joe finish off the last series. So in the in the interest of, you know, parity, um, we had to do it. We had to do it. So uh, thank you so much for coming on. Um, now I'm going to bombard you with questions for the next 40 minutes. I interviewed Joe for the finale of the last series and now I'm with the other half of Tefl Works, uh, founding Joe. I'm not sure if you listened to that episode, but were Joe's answers completely accurate? No. I would say about 50% accurate. Okay. I listened to it at the time though, so that was back in October, so I can't remember everything and, and obviously I don't want to pull him up in all his mistakes, but there were plenty. <laughs> <laughs> well, fair enough. We'll get the we we'll the proper version of events this time. So um, <laughs> let's take it back to the, let's uh, let's take it back to the early nineties. You're studying politics. You graduate, and then two years later, you find yourself taking the CELTA um, and teaching in Greece. So what happened in, the, in those two years? How did that come about? It, it, it was kind of the plan all along. Um, I didn't enjoy university. Uh, that was my second attempt, which I did at least complete. Um, but I didn't have much interest really in staying in the UK. And I knew I wanted to live and work abroad. So I didn't want to do the travel mm -hmm. thing. I didn't want to go away and travel for a year or two a gap year. I wanted to actually go and live and work somewhere. My plan at the time was that I would go. I wanted to join the diplomatic service, but I, my degree wasn't going to be good enough. So what you could do, there were other things you could do. You could show you could live and work abroad, that you pick up a language. So that was my intention. So I decided um, that doing TEFL was the best way of, of sort of achieving all the sort of all the goals in one go. Um, I, so I finished my degree and then I went and lived in Edinburgh, but I needed to do the, at the time it wasn't a CELTA, it was called a TEFLA. So it's a certificate in teaching okay. English as a foreign language to adults. I think it was called something like that. Um, so I needed, I knew I was going to need to save up to pay for the course. I was going to need to be able to live for a month. And I was going to have to also get, pay for rent in Edinburgh while not working. So I went back north and worked in a bank for a year to save the money. And then I came back to Edinburgh, yeah. got, got the flat and, and did my course. And I was basically just didn't have any clear idea originally of where I wanted to go and teach. Um, but I taught some Spanish students, well, I taught Italian, Spanish, German, some Buddhist monks, Nepalese monks, um, Hong Kong, wow. Korean. It was all, that was all part of the Satefla course at the time. So, but the Spanish students were the easiest. So I thought that's that's the place to go. Okay. So, so I spent, I did my course in the June. <laughs> I spent all of July applying to, to for jobs in Spain. Didn't get any answer. Didn't get any answer. And, and probably like anybody else, um, going out to do their first TEFL job, you, you, you've qualified. You're impatient. You just and I wasn't fussy, so I didn't get the job as far as I was aware in Spain. So I just started applying to anything and everything. So I applied to. Um, for a job in Greece, as one of the many applications. I don't know, I probably put about 10 applications. It seemed like a lot at the time. Uh, and I got this job in Greece. Uh -huh. um, never heard of the place in my life. Um, looked it up in a map and it was a, a small town in the middle of the mountains. So coming from Fort William, I was like, oh, well, <laughs> it's much the same as one to the other. It's not, not, not much difference. So I thought that, that sound seemed fine. Sure. So I yeah, accepted the job within a couple of days after the application. And uh, so then three days later, got accepted for a place in Spain. But um, I felt I had gone down the route. I'd accepted the application in Greece, uh, the, the position in Greece. So I, I, I went with Greece and then there. So it kind of never looked back. So that, was, that was how I ended up in Greece. Not, not mm. by any planning at all, apart from doing a <laughs> TEFL course. 
Of course, yeah. Um, and in terms of that move to Greece, you know, obviously, obviously, even moving from Fort William to Edinburgh is like it is. It's a huge move. So, what was it like going from a big city to somewhere quite remote in in Greece? Then was there a bit of a culture shock? Did it take a lot of adaptation or? Yeah, I mean, I'd, I'd actually been out in Austria when I was nineteen as an au pair, so I didn't. I had lived abroad previously, so. But I did sure. also speak some German. Um, was one of the reasons I, I went to Austria. Uh, so going to Greece, yeah, I think it, it was a huge cultural shock. Um, I flew into Athens. I got a taxi um, to the bus station, which I think it still happens in Greece. I'm not so sure it's so common. But you, the taxi driver won't take just one ta person. They, they fill up their taxi with other people going in the same direction. Oh. So you're in a taxi with random people okay. you don't know, and so that, and then I did get to the bus station. Uh, bus out of Athens was quite strange, but then arriving in this town, it's it's quite different. It, it doesn't, it didn't particularly then feel particularly European. It definitely had an Eastern uh, feel to it. Um, you've got billboards everywhere, which you don't get in the UK or much of um, Europe, really, in the way that they have. And, the buildings were completely different. Everything was just different. And I remember, I think, my first or second day sitting in a, on a park bench in a park eh, and realising that I didn't understand a word of what anyone was saying, which, you know, I had lived out in Germany, but I did have basic German. So, and it was, it was a mixture of excitement and fear. But it was, yeah, no, I think more excitement was overrun, but it, it was a really strange feeling that this is... Like nothing I've ever encountered before. Germany and well, Austria was very, I'm going to say, civilized. It was very European. Um, so um, Greece was n not quite the same at all. And the music you could hear, you could hear, you hear the clarinet playing all the time, and then the church bells ring, and they don't ring in tune. And it was just like it was amazing. But um, no, it was exciting. <laughs> that's. I mean, yeah, that's. That's that's what you want. As long as, long as it's exciting, obviously it's, it's going to be challenging. Yeah. It's going to be a little bit frightening in, in yeah. a certain way. But um, so I asked I asked Joe this because you also went to teach on in France. Um, mm -hmm. So you taught in Greece. That's totally new. Then you taught in France, and then since you went on to co-found the TEFL work as a you know mm -hmm. a TEFL course provider of enormous repute. I have to ask: was, was there a lot that you saw or that you worked with when you were abroad when you that made you sort of think? This isn't good enough. Like I, I could do this better. I, I, this needs this industry needs fresh voices. Was there anything like in particular that made you go like, no, this, this, this could be different. I, yeah, I, I think there are, but I think every country is different. So <clears throat> to come from the UK and say, oh, we can fix all this and these, all these multiple countries where you've got different cultures, different methods of learning is quite difficult. I think the main thing is, is to try and give the teachers as good a grounding as you can. Um, you, and also hopefully that we inform people of what it is like a, a abroad, um, living in different countries, accepting, you know, as, as, as much as you can as an individual. Um, the, the ways that things are done, you know, in Greece, um, there is or was a lot of rote learning in the Greek classrooms, but of the state schools, but not in this so much at all in the private schools. And every private school, because we taught in, in Greece, yeah. it's private schools um, that you teach in, um, who have owners, who are trained teachers normally, and then they have, or they, they did have, when we were there, you would have Greek teachers and uh, English, native English speaking teachers or um, from, from different countries, I mean, there was a lot of the native English teacher does this and the Greek teachers do that. It was quite um, split. So if you you didn't really need to worry about teaching grammar to 10 year olds, that would be done by a Greek teacher who would be doing it in Greek, explaining the reasoning behind it, while you would then maybe have them um, to start conversation, you know, the, the basics of speaking. Um, maybe English teachers could know more grammar. Um, English speaking uh, teachers could definitely know more grammar. It's, um, my grammar, I'm com really confident writing. I have no idea what the rules are or why I do it. It's just I know that that's what you do, which is not a great way of teaching to kids. Um, 
they do need people explaining to them. Um, and then when you went to teach business English, um, again, it depended on the company you were going to teach to as to the motivation of the students. They were also teaching adults who don't like to make a fool of themselves at all. And they think if they get something wrong in speech, which I, I'm the same when, I, when I'm speaking French or something, you know, you're, you're worried about whether you're saying it correctly and do you sound stupid? And, you know, adults everywhere are like that. So the, the teenagers, young people are, are kind of more fun sometimes to teach. And, you know, you do have classroom control things and that. But um, I, sometimes businesses would make their work because they have to do so much training. Uh, each business has to pay sure. so much out of their um, profits or whatever to pay for training by law. So English language teaching could be the easiest thing sometimes. So you would have some people that really didn't want to be there or there were very mixed levels. And it was just that that's the hour that everybody could be out of their workplace to come in and do a lesson. Um, so there were things around that. But I think one of the main things was, was that we hopefully teach it is, is preparing people for the differences in um, different situations that you you go into in the classroom they're not all the same every country's different every classroom's different every learning mm-hmm. institution facility is different so um i think it's it, it's maybe to teach acceptance is one of the main things i hope hopefully we're giving people a really good grounding <laughs> teaching them an accept or, or all the different topics, we can't cover everything, but all the different areas that, you know, you might walk into or end up teaching, whether it's online teaching now or when we were, you know, when I used to teach business, um, there was a lot of telephone teaching because people have to speak on the phone to people in other countries and they speak in English. If it's German and French, they actually more likely speak in English than speak in one of those languages. So it's, you know, then right. it was being able to... Um, teach without seeing someone you know you don't have all the interaction you know are you picking up intonation correctly and language and what's friendly language and what's like too formal and so the result I mean, we used to, that, that was an interesting thing which you never encountered in Greece so I think we do cover with the sort of all the different courses um sort of the majority of situations you can end up teaching in so I think yeah that that was my main areas that I took away from it was that it actually was all very different and one size doesn't fit all. But hopefully, if you use the basic TEPL methods that we teach, you can adjust them to whichever, adjust and adapt them to wherever you go to teach. Um, Because we did encounter places where this is our methodology and you must teach it like this. And it it just didn't work. Yeah. Flexibility and adaptability Mm. probably. Yeah. Um, so take us to 2008 then, um, stepping forward in time quite a, quite a way. But um, so talk, t- talk to me about the process of, of founding the TEFL org and what the initial months were like. OK, um, well, Joe spent several months. Or he, he physically built, you know, we, our website, all our courses, um, everything was done and set up. You know, we, we did it all. Joe did most of it um, while I continued in my, my employment. And then we decided we were going to launch. We had a launch date for the company and sort of a month before we decided I was going to pack in my job too. And we were just going to go for it. Um, we were, I suppose, <laughs> don't know if we were confident. We just thought if we were going to go for it we should just really go for it and um so we had, we had three young kids at this point as well we just not long moved house we set up a we had a long shed in the back garden so we we got an electrician in which right. I think was probably it was maybe not the best electrician <laughs> when we set it all up and we had all our, <laughs> our comms and our printers and everything and a desk each and a little a little wall between us <laughs> we didn't have two working close together um, right from the beginning um, and we set it up and we, we sort of gave each other or gave ourselves roles Joe was going to be marketing and sales because his background was in marketing and, and, and sales and I was going to be sort of Sort of all the operations, stuffing of envelopes, the all the customer communications and all that sort of thing. But quite quickly, um, 
Joe's role of, well, doing a lot of the IT and uh, e-commerce, so it would have been more or less at that time, and managing the website, that was enough for him. And he actually didn't, he wasn't so keen on the sale. The sales wasn't quite where he maybe thought it was. Marketing and sales are not the same thing. So um, I took on the sales role uh-huh. quite early on. And we. I think he told the story of our, our first customer trying to make a sale, I think. We, um, he very kindly kept phoning back and we eventually got a sale through <laughs> PayPal or something, I think. And, you know, it worked past eight at night when mm-hmm. we were meant to be doing a platinum nine to five job, which it never ever was. Um, so uh-huh. that was w- once we made our first sale <coughs> and then we ran our first course with like four people on it. And we actually also had a couple of people that joined us really early on. on I, I'm not 100%. I presume they got paid. <laughs> just just gonna, you know, but Thomas, who you've already interviewed, would be able to confirm whether he did ever get paid right at the beginning or whether he, he did it in faith that it would work as well. So, um, so like Thomas was with us very early on. Um, so that, that was a big bonus because we, obviously with online, we um, I'd previously been an online tutor for a, a good few years as well, actually. Um, when we lived in France, I did online tutoring and also back in the UK okay. for a period of time. So we we had all that, in, but once we started making sales to try and tutor or, or to, you know, to, to mark people's work, it's, if you've not got the time, it's not for the people. So, and quality was really important to us from the beginning. I think that was, um, that for me, that was quality and drive, uh, customer service were, were my main driving forces right from the beginning. So we had an eye on that all, all along. So right from the first few months, we also, you know, trying to make sales and all this, but we also went for our accreditation right from the beginning with our courses because um, it was really important. It, it okay. took 18 months, I think, to get, but we set out right from the beginning wanting to create courses that were going to be good enough to be accredited. So, you know, that at all times, I, I guess the focus was the teacher whether it be the customer service or the quality of the, the of the offering we were giving. Um, and you have to remember it was nearly 15 years ago. We were just discussing that earlier today. And uh, oh. so online was was a, a big thing, but it wasn't as ubiquitous as now. It wasn't as accepted. And, you know, people did have fear uh-huh. of buying online and, and you know, um, where you, if you're, if, you know, if you're online, are you a real company? How can we, you know, can we come to your office in London? And you're like, um, no, <laughs> I don't have an office in London. Yeah. But there was all these sort of presumptions made, and and because it's a generic term, TEFL, like, well, you've been going for forty years. And you're like, well, no, we're, you know, it's, it's trying to differentiate yourself as well within the market, and the, it, as an industry, can sometimes have it, you know, quite a cowboy. Um, you know, making my best company set up and and you have to try and differentiate yourself from that. But one of the reasons, you know, we went for our, our accreditation earlier on as well was, you know, it, for business security as well as customer service, quality for the um, um, quality of course as well. So that was, it was, um, yeah, it was quite frantic. It was quite, you know, it was busy. We had three, as I said, three young kids. The boys used to come home and have to stuff envelopes because everything you know, we sent out letters, confirmation booking letters. We got a lot of bookings in in the post with checks in and, you know, so you're up to the bank. So, um, and, and brochures, we, you know, getting brochures out. Now you're thinking, I don't know if we still do work with show maintenance. I don't know if we still do brochures. I did see a pile of them recently, but I think we, you know, everything's downloads. So there was a lot of, um, a lot more manual stuff than we have now. But, yeah. It's it's just I I still find it remarkable to hear about the fact that it went from no matter how big a shed it was right the fact that it went from a shed <laughs> to what it is now is just it's it's incredible yeah, to me. I mean, it really is um, we 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 got a couple of part time staff in and I think at that point they were young they were like school leavers and you're like is this safe we're in a wooden shed mm-hmm. <laughs> staffing numbers in this wooden shed and the electricity so it's like desperate looking you know, everywhere for a for a uh, office space that was we would be comfortable having staff in so that, that was the reason for the first office. <laughs> feeling inspired 
Fancy trying something completely new? We'll make your best move yet by signing up for a TEFL course with the most highly accredited provider on the planet. Here at the TEFL Org, we offer a range of online and classroom courses that you can study at your own pace. All of our courses include top of the range teaching materials and come with dedicated tutor support from experienced and highly qualified TEFL experts. And what's more, we'll give you money off to do it. Just enter the code PODCAST at checkout to get 50% off any of our internationally recognised TEFL courses. And that includes our best-selling 120-hour Premier Online course. With that code, you'll not only get 50% off, but you'll also get a free lesson plans pack. Within a matter of months, you could be a qualified TEFL teacher, out there exploring the world, or working to your own schedule from home as an online English teacher. Just use the code PODCAST at checkout to get started. So, Jennifer, you've described yourself as a travel junkie uh, on the TEFL Org's website. But in the initial stages of the TEPL Org, it must have been about, as you described, hunkering down, building the teaching material, building a staff. When was the first business trip that you got with the TEPL Org and how much of a relief was it to get kind of back out there? I ended up being the person who didn't do the travelling on the whole and I, oh. Joe, went out and got to China and all of that. I might have gone out the first time to China. I think we went away maybe 2013 or 14, 2013, got to China um, mm-hmm. and that was very exciting. We went to Beijing and Shanghai, we had, um, uh, we were meeting with sort of partners or possible partners and um, the SDI, which is Scottish Development Best something like that, I can't remember, but they're the, the, the arm of the Scottish Government, so they, they help businesses looking to, to go out abroad. Um, so I did one or two trips and it was really exciting and it was very different to, I, I've never been to anywhere like China and um, Beijing and Shanghai where we went to are completely different cities, um, so it was, it was a real experience and I think I was out once more a few months later when you had Thailand as well because we ran some uh, four week long courses for a short period of time in Thailand with, par- with partners out there. So I was out for those, but after that, it was Joe that got most of the travelling until we um, sort of withdrew a bit from China and um, we went with the, the strategy was, was internationalisation, but in the USA. So I got the trips out to do the investigatory stuff for the USA and setting up some. Um, you know, some more boring things like setting up bank accounts and meeting lawyers and that. But um, so I got I got those. But yeah, no, it was really good. Um, but most of my travel has unfortunately been within Scotland. So the class going ahead and working the main my main trips with, with work, I, I said, except for a few. So it has been you know it's uh, I, I can't complain. But um, yeah, no, I don't get to travel. <laughs> yeah, well, I object that I didn't get that. <laughs> I think I got four or five trips in the in the few years. So. No, that was uh, it. Was it was really exciting. I got out to Seattle. Um, it's a Tesla big Tesla conference there, and, and met up with lots of different um, Tesla related people, businesses, etc. So that was like a week long of that, and then uh-huh. then you out to LA and San Francisco with. But that was much more sort of business business rather than Tesla. All so. oh, right. Okay. No, that's. Cool. Um, so I have to ask this because I mean, I've, I've, you know, you're a co-founder of a, of a successful business. Um, so a- after co-founding, um, what were the main challenges in terms of like growing the company and becoming an established player within the Tefl industry? You, you kind of touched it on, right, on a, you, mm. you, you kind of touched it already, but were there any sort of early wins? Uh, uh, or partnerships or that kind of thing that made you think like, okay, we're on the right track now. Yeah, I think I going back to when I actually talked most about the accreditation, the first accreditation we went for was um, SQA Scotland, which is a national awarding body in Scotland. We went for accreditation through them um, because that actually gave us access to what uh, a funding um, 
option that they had at the time called ILA, the Independent Learning Account. Mm -hmm. And it was really, um, it gave at one point was about 50% of our business when we were initially, we were TEFL Scotland and then we were TEFL England and then TEFL Wales and TEFL Ireland. But when we were TEFL Scotland into the first 18 months or so, and even when we started in England, that was about 50%. So the accreditation was really worthwhile and it just meant, you know, people could go, go come back to the idea that you're an online business and people want to check that you're real and you're, you know, you really exist and um, that your, accredit your, your courses are worth something um, uh, and that you're recognised as a, as a learning training provider. Mm -hmm. So that, that was a really big win for us um, that they did withdraw it only a couple of years or so later, but we also had knowledge this was happening. So we were able to sort of refocus the business and, and you know, look at where else we could be bringing money from. Or, well, we were already growing. You know, we, we, we started, the intention had been purely to be TEFL Scotland. Um, but, you know, within 12 month period or so, we, we realised that we were doing well. We, we were, with the marketing skills, well, Joe had the marketing skills, um, from his prior work, um, I suppose we were running quite smoothly. So we, you know, the operationally wise, we had that going. Um, I was still doing sales, I think, probably at that point as well as running the operations. We'd brought in a couple of people um, quite early on. We'd got an office in Dingwall. Um, and again, we're bringing in people there that could help out. So I, th I think um, get, getting an office, actually making that move into an office was good because you were able to employ people so it wasn't just to either you know employ people to do something you can't do or employ people to you know do the, the work that you don't have time to do and it, it just helps you know staffing up lets you concentrate on the things that let the company make the company grow and um, so that's it's important that you're only doing the, um, the things that make the company grow really um, when you're small or any size but that that's uh, really important particularly um, and yeah, I mentioned as well about it's, the, the industry can be seen as a bit of a cowboy industry. So, it, you know, it comes back to, again, accreditation, giving good customer service. You know, at the time when we um, when we started out, our 30, it, it's still more or less the same, actually, 30% of sales at that point came from word of mouth. So we tracked it, or tried as much as you can to track it. So word of mouth at that time was just... Oh, I went in this course. Yeah, they, I would recommend them. Now it's obviously it's online reviews, and I think it is still something like that when they break it down, there's a high um, percentage of our, our uh, sales come because of, of good word of mouth. Um, and that was something we learned early on as well. And we went out, we used to go around the universities, um, meet career staff, put up flyers. You know, we did everything. So think we don't do now because um, everything is online. But 15 years yeah. ago, it wasn't completely online. You had to really mix your marketing much more. So we did put in long hours. Um, um, and I think that's it. It's just keeping a really good eye on money, working really hard, um, being really what was now, you know, all, all during the pandemic, the word was pivot. So we were pivoting frequently in the past. You know, yeah. That didn't work. Stop, stop that right now. Go and do this. This works really well. Let's do lots more of that. Let's stop working. Let's change. You're a small uh -huh. company. You can do it. Um, once you've got staff, it becomes quite stressful for them. <laughs> an issue. Yeah. We go back. No, no, no. We're not doing that anymore. But you just decided you were doing that last week. And be like, no, 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 no. We, we've completely changed our mind. We're doing something. And that is really stressful for staff. Like, like well, I just don't know what I'm doing. So. <laughs> Managing staff's expectation and our expectations was also another thing that we, we learned. And um, we did a lot of word of mouth recruiting, which um, ha has worked out for us. We still have Miss Erin McKenzie, um, who was a word mm -hmm. of mouth recruit from a uh, school when she was about 17 or 18. And that was her um, uh, yeah, after, after school job. So it was, yeah, trying to find the right people to help you as you grow as well is really important. So that's, um, yeah, that was, that was a big learning at the beginning. And in, in terms of growth um, as a company, there was also a lot of kind of personal uh, development um, in, in your career, particularly um, when you went to Strathclyde Business School to do the Growth Advantage program. Um, that was yeah. after becoming managing director uh, in 2014. How, how important was that in your in your development, would you say? 
Yeah, it was quite. I'd, I'd taken over the year before, I uh-huh. think, roughly. And um, one reason was we needed Joe's focus on the. Um, he he was our paper click person, which this has been a massive, you know, our e marketing and uh, online marketing is massively important to us, and taking away focus from it always causes us uh, grief. So um, we and I had been a manager and you had a training previously, but that was within uh, the public sector. So you've got all the rules and everything's all made up for you, and, and that's managing developing strategy or, or or for a business and and having to sort of think of the whole everything that's going on in the business from every team um wasn't something I'd ever done. And we wanted to grow. We knew we wanted to grow and we had had a we were still growing but we had sort of slowed down, we plateaued a bit and so we were wanting to improve. Um and I'm quite willing to accept, you know, and I don't know how to do things or, you know, and, and I like learning. So it was a really pivotal thing. It was over, you know, it was tra- it was um, a course over like, an eight, nine month period. So it was a long, you went and you did your stuff, you took it back into the office. So how you could implement stuff or you couldn't because it didn't always work. It's also, um, you, you meet a group of peers um, who are going through the same thing as you, completely different industries and businesses, but it, you know, and then, um, and then there's a lot of support and backup to, to this day. I'm uh, like, uh, tomorrow evening, I'm out with five of the group that I, I did my course with. And we've got, oh. we go, we will have fun at some point in the evening, but we have a list of priorities <laughs> of what we have for discussion first. Um, but it's the same. I mean, it's the same as um, actually the last time I probably experienced something like that was being a TEFL teacher in Greece. Where you you have a group of people where you, um, you we used to work in different schools. At the end of the day, you all meet up. Um, not every day, but you know, a few times a week, discuss. I mean, it could be you could be sitting discussing grammar points. How do you teach this? How do you teach? I mean, you're sitting at a pub, but you're still discussing these things so that you can go in the next morning. And say, well, I, I didn't read about it, but so and so there just told me how you know, I've, I've written up my lesson plan, I know what I'm going to do. Um, and when we and it's still sort of you know, in touch with all these people too. And I, th- I think you meet you know, peer groups, um, whether it be you know, at, at uh, Strathclyde or whether it was from Temple Teaching, um, I think we're on a, a learning journey, which I think as a Temple teacher you are a lot of the time because you go out, you've, you've done your training and that, but you, you, there's no way you know everything, you know, it's years of work before you know everything. And uh, but there will be other people who know more than you, and uh, so I think, um, yeah, continual training, whether it's uh, yeah, running a business or as a TEFL teacher, is really useful. And and the peer learning is is one of the best ways of learning things quite often. I mean, obviously, you know that that self improvement and that willingness to learn has led to really amazing opportunities. Um, one of which mm-hmm. we'll, we'll touch on now. Um, you're an ambassador for Women's Enterprise Scotland, um, and you know you're a very established and, and proud female entrepreneur and businesswoman. Mm-hmm. Um, but I wanted to ask, and we'll, we'll touch more on this later on as well. But what challenges did you face, particularly early on, um, and was, or I guess is, uh, the English teaching environment very male dominated? What was it like being in no. that space? Okay. Yeah, well, the English language teaching, no, when you go, oh. it's 60 to 70% women, I think, do TEFL. Right. Um, teaching, yeah, it's, it's um, it was definitely female dominated. Um, and even out in Greece, I'm trying to think how many years ago I was out there, 30, 25, <laughs> 25 years ago, it, the school owners were largely female, even then. It's, Great, it's right. quite a, a female industry, I think, female-led industry. I mean, I suppose teaching is, though, you know, teaching in, you know, going to a primary school or something here, it's still, it's, it's more, um, there are there are plenty of male, there's, there's a lot more male temple teachers than there are maybe male primary school teachers or something in the UK. But um, it's it's not overly male-dominated, actually. It's it's not too bad. There, um, and I think it's, yeah, it's pretty equal opportunity compared to, I mean, Obviously, different countries are maybe slightly more sexist or otherwise than uh-huh. some others. So that that's probably. But even then, as I say, I would say Greece is a slightly macho culture. But even there, you know, twenty five years ago, the majority of school owners that I knew were, were definitely female. Um, but business in the UK is not that way. It's definitely more male oriented. Uh-huh. 
it's slightly more sexist. So um, yeah, I, I wouldn't say yeah. I definitely don't think Tefl's too bad. I think in general, um, travel and uh, working and living abroad, women are quite adventurous and have been for a long time. And you, you know, you can find many examples of women who have gone and worked and lived and travelled abroad. So yeah. I think it's it's not actually too bad. It's, it's, it's quite a positive compared to there are other aspects that, of Tefl that are you know people will have um, issues with, but I don't think it's particularly sexist, which is good. That is, yeah, of course. Um, so one thing that you, you mentioned earlier on that will, oh, I think there's a dog having fun in the background there. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> Amazing. A squeaky toy in the chair. <laughs> that's staying in. That's staying in regardless of what. Um, <laughs> Uh, now, so, oh, you're laughing at me. <laughs> oh, no, 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 no. Just endorsing the behaviour, no, not, no, not no, laughing at I know. Yeah, he's, uh, he's, uh, he's gone silent. He's looking at me. He's oh. Like, oh, no, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. <laughs> um, <laughs> so you, you touched on it a little bit earlier. Um, you've taught business English. Um, now, I was wondering if you could tell our listeners about how important finding a niche within TEFL teaching is. Um, and where that particular skill set took you. Um, and what kind of businesses did you end up teaching to? Yeah, um, so we did, I taught sort of, in Greece it was 12 to 18, 19 year olds. And then in France, it was a wide range of businesses. So I taught anything mm. from Continental, the tyre company. Right. Um, there I taught the... So some, I, I taught someone way up there, I can't remember. <laughs> Um, but he was, he came over from China to help run the, the factory, so it, he was probably quite important. Um, and then Ave, Avon, I taught at Avon, which was quite interesting. Mm -hmm. Taught um, oh, like local, lots of, there was um, a lot of food manufacturing where we were in the north of France, so there was a lot of um, teaching managers and factories. Um, I, I generally had one-to-one -one groups, I think, when I was teaching largely. Um, I also taught, uh, I think it was, an, see, I'm going to say an admiral. Well, I've got a general in the French Air Force, so out at an, wow. an air base near us. So he was he was interested because they don't have an RAF as such. It's the army, it's the, the, the air army. So he was really, and he used to tell me what his topics were that he wanted. I mean, his English was good, what he wanted to discuss. So I did twice hugely embarrassed myself. Once I was having a glass of Ribena before I went, I was sitting in the car. I was having a <laughs> carton of Ribena before I went in with my white shirt and managed to squish this out and no. cover myself and Ribena and had to go in. So that was, so you're going to new and security checks before you ever get near them. So that's, that was, <laughs> but he also wanted to discuss the um, Russian submarine that had sunk and they, they, it, was, it was about 20 years and it sunk and there was people, men stuck in it and they weren't accepting help from other countries. So I, I got an, a UK newspaper or American newspaper and took it in and I was like, so today we're going to talk about um, uh, President Putin. Why I changed it from Putin, because Putin in French is... Um, quite a bad swear word. So. Yeah, I thought that. I did think so, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> so, yeah, he still kept, I still kept my classes. <laughs> they could change, you know, if they didn't like you, they could just phone up the, the, the school that was running it and say, no, I don't want that person back. But mm -hmm. I was a lot more mortified. He wasn't at all. I think it would be one of these stories that he would have gone and told, you'll never guess what my English teacher said today. <laughs> Really I mean, it's just Putin. I don't know why. I thought, yeah, I just put a French accent on. Mm. So that was, yeah, you many, many things learned when you were teaching. Uh, but I, I think I probably preferred, if I was to have carried on, I'd have gone back to teaching um, teenagers, which okay. if you told me that when I started, I wouldn't have believed it at all. But um, I really enjoyed teaching um you know, my classes were sort of from age 12 to 18 and to see them go through and progress and and they um, were really going for their Cambridge qualifications at that time. Um, so if you get your 
you know, it's really important to them to, for their future progression, but also you end up having young people that you, you've sort of taught from the age of 13 through to you know, 17, 18, getting ready to go off to university. They've got all these qualifications that you've helped and, you know, um, I'm going to really stand them in great stead going forward. And uh, I had my first child um, well, my final year out there, so I am. Um, I wasn't teaching full time, but my three that I'd started with, my young youngest classmen, um, they came to me for private lessons, which we they didn't need to do them because they'd got the qualifications, and we didn't really do much apart from play with the baby and you know, talk about what it'd been like when I you know, stories from when I'd started and what uh -huh. they thought of me and what I thought of them. So, but it, it was a really good good experience to, to create a really good bond. Um, uh -huh. You know, people that you stay in touch with. So it's, it's really, yeah, I, I, really rewarding. I think. Mm -hmm. well, I was I was going to ask actually. The next question would be about, um, you know, considering your teaching, uh, the teaching side of your career and what your main strengths are. Mm -hmm. But it sounds like kind of relationship building was a really was really important yeah, to you. Yeah, I think it was. I don't think I was. I was an average teacher. <laughs> No. I knew most of it. I, I would, no, I, I, you know, you, you, you can see other teachers, some people that are really born to it or they're really, really entertaining. And people don't always know until they get into a classroom what they're going to be like either. Or, you know, you're pay I've got, I had probably quite a lot of patience. Um, I had uh, good relations with most of the kids. Um, uh, I was relatively not strict, but yeah, we were working. But if you worked, then we, we could have some more fun. Um, I, you know, I was pretty diligent in my prep, and my marking, and and learning. Um, and I was, I, you know, you gain confidence because things like not knowing, because you're just not going to know everything, and it's to know, have the confidence to not try and just muddle through and say something that's a load of rubbish, because they will feel, you know, they will find that out. They will know if you don't know. Mm. Um, and say, well, I don't know, but I'll go away today. Come back, we'll review it in the next lesson, and and just. Um, it's probably quite, I'm probably quite a calm teacher, so that would be one of the, the main things. And then relatively structured most of the time, and not too easy to distract because when you've got a bunch of teenagers, that's a prime. If they're in the mood to not work, then their aim, their pure goal, is to just distract you from whatever you want to teach. But you know, it's um, their parents. They were private schools. Their parents were paying a lot of money to put them through this, so it's, it's fine to have fun some of the time. But you know, there is an end goal. And also for the school that you worked with, um, if you they don't produce kids getting the passes, then they lose all the students. They just move on to the next school. So uh -huh. you know they are business. You know it depends where you are, but a lot of schools are businesses. So you know you've got to be aware of that too. But yeah, definitely in relationships and the people you meet and experiences you have. And I've got recipes still from you know kids have given me. So oh, they bring it and you got fed. You got so well fed. <laughs> Right, Mothers okay. would give food, oh yeah, olive oil bottles or look, oh. you know, their wine or whatever they you know, you get all things brought into you. So very nice. But um, yeah, no, it's a really, really good experience. I think the experience of living and working somewhere, I mean, there's a lot, lot of frustrations living somewhere different um, and when they don't do things the way you think it should be done. But um, I think it's a good experience. Are you looking for a weekly guide to what's going on in the TEFL world? Do you want some advice on everything from job interviews to underrated TEFL destinations? Well, the TEFL Org blog has it all. Every single week, we tackle some of the biggest questions in the TEFL industry. Stay up to date with the latest trends in English teaching, find tips to make your next job application your best yet, or get inspired and read about the experiences of TEFL Org graduates teaching all around the world. Whether you're brand new to the industry, or you've seen it all, we can guarantee an interesting read each week. To find out more, go to tefl.org forward slash blog. That's T-E-F-L dot O-R-G forward slash blog. Um, right, so I wanted to touch more on the ambassadorial work that you do. So so what is your role with the Women's Enterprise Scotland? What, what does that involve? Yeah, the the main thing is is um is, is actually acting as a role model first and foremost, um, and being visible as a woman in business. 
Um, mm-hmm. So, um, you know, I, every so often I email the marketing department and say, right, so what, what, where have we been in PR? What have we had for the last three quarters of, you know, quarter of the year, sorry. Um, and they they collate this. So we, we it's really, there's a real focus on, yeah, women being uh, viewed in public as, as um in business, running businesses, not just running business, but actually being in businesses rather than, you know, going and working maybe in more, um, like, public sector where I was previously, which is which is high, you know, high numbers of female employees or teachers or just the, their women, there's other opportunities for people. So we do a lot of that. Um, we, with the Women's Enterprise Scotland also advocates for female businesses in situations where maybe there's been issues or problems. Um, they do a lot of work on um, gathering statistics and information, getting reports and um, looking at funding, how much funding goes to women business, female uh, led businesses. It's, it's, it's minuscule, you know, and if we had so many more women um, run businesses, what would be the increase in the economy? So it's, it's very facts and figures led um, it's a lot of policy research in it um, but people like me who are ambassadors we're just there to really keep uh, showing up and um, turning up at places where um, we we go for example there's the Scottish Government does uh, I think that you can go along to every quarter they have lots of business leaders and they, you're allowed to put in questions etc so for the last I don't know five, six years, Women's Enterprise Scotland have had like the first 10 questions. They've tried all sorts of ways to not have us having the first questions. Um, but Nicola Sturgeon right. actually recently brought it up in a speech, laughing, saying, yeah, we, just sort of, we know the first question is going to be Women's Enterprise Scotland with a focus on, you know, women-led businesses. We've got a working hard for a women's uh, business hub where you, people will be able to get all the information they want. The Women's Business Centre is now online as well. Okay, so okay. It's just because um, it wasn't something I ever, th- yeah, it was not something I ever thought of doing. Um, my daughter's much more, you know, she's 17, she's sixth year looking at. Gone and we, we you know, you go and do talks at school, so I've done things like that as well. Um, and they do try to raise, you know, the schools do make an effort as well, but the, the pushes straight to university, do a professional qualification if you're, you know, clever enough, blah, blah, blah. Um, there's still not a huge variety um, of options being given to people at a young age, I think, not just girls, but across the board, of what you could be doing. Uh-huh. But it is more likely that a boy would turn around and go, I'm going to set up my own business than anything, you know, a young, a young female. So it's to just raise awareness that this is, you know, a real possibility for people. So that's, uh-huh. yeah, we, we do quite a lot across Scotland and working internationally, there's groups similar across the world. Um, so there's, there's a, I don't go, I'm still missing out on the travel there, but um, there's, you know, there's been um, events in Japan and America and uh, where right. groups have got together. Um, the other thing is, is particularly an investment in women's businesses is a big thing. So something else I am now is um, uh, part of an angel investment group, so um, Mint Ventures. So our focus is coming out for Women's Enterprise Scotland is on uh, investing in companies that are female-led, that are looking to be of benefit or do good to the community. Um, so it's not sort of all high tech. We're not looking particularly, I mean, some, some of the stuff is tech, but looking at um, investments, which are much more um, aimed at what good they can do and uh, for women and the general community. So that's um, come out of it as well. So it's, there's a lot, of, a lot of different options in that area. Mm-hmm. And in terms of your experience of, of Scottish business, um, and in particular, I mean, regarding Women's Enterprise Scotland and um, the endeavours, you know, you've you've uh, achieved there. But how how have things changed in Scottish business since you've been involved? Have you have you noticed more female leaders, more female mentors? Um, are, are you seeing more and more female entrepreneurs becoming prominent? Um, what's has the landscape changed much? 
I, I think there's been a clear effort to to change the landscape in certain parts. I mean, the government itself is probably it's probably quite pro equality and parity, um, and they have supported different groups. Um, yeah, looking into sort of parity. There's work, you know, there's ongoing um, work to get board um, parity, so, but we're quite far off mm -hmm. that. Um, the pandemic was actually quite a negative, and there, I can't remember specifically, there was a funding uh, grants that went out from Scottish Enterprise, and no female businesses got any of them. Um, it, so it really hit, there was a lot less funding than there was all the one of the worst hit industries was like the beauty industry as well. There was very little support yeah. given there. So what's gone forward, they actually, the pandemic probably hit quite badly. A lot of what are seen as more female um, industries when we, we, we're fine, we're, sure. you know, we're online, isn't it? Um, so although I would say, you know, our customers are, there's a lot of female customers and that's a business we we weren't we we're not in that box of being a female um, industry or seen that way, but um definitely sort of hairdressing beauty these are these are a lot of female led businesses um who, who were very badly affected. Then you have got groups like Women's Enterprise Scotland, which are working really hard. There was a rose review by RBS Bank, which has done a lot to highlight the inequalities, and you know it's ongoing um. They've not dropped it, so it will, you know, they keep going. Um, they will be collecting the statistics and the data over the next few years. Um, so it can seem a lot better. Um, and I certainly know a lot more female founders, but that might just be because of the, the group I'm mixing in rather than anything to do with there being a lot more. Um, Women's Enterprise Scotland's doing a lot. They, they had a limited number of ambassadors, but they have been growing that number, which is good because. Mm. You know, sometimes somebody's doing a really great job doing something somewhere and you just don't know anything about it because it's not picked up. Or it's um, quite often in business news, you seem to see the same names in the same places and that, you know, the, the ones that have got the £10 million funding rather than somebody that's built their business up without funding. And um, so it's, it's, it's a mixed bag, I would say. It's not, it's not as positive as you would want, but hopefully it'll, you know, it will get better. Mm -hmm. um, I, I've spoken to women for this podcast who've set up their own teaching business or they've gone freelance or so on what from your experience would be your best piece of advice for young women listening or watching this who want to teach and make a mark from a business perspective what would be my best I think um, to they say women are less um, are more risk averse I don't think that's exactly true. I think they just take more considered risks. So I would say, you know, weigh up your risks and actually take the considered risks. Don't go, oh no, actually that's just too much. If you've, if you've worked out and you think, you know, and you've got your best scenario and your worst possible scenario, and if the worst possible scenario is something that you can live with, then then take the risk, you know, take the risk. Uh, you know, um, don't be stupid and do, you know, throw everything in and, you know, that said, we, we nearly did that so when we stayed up, we did, um, you know, we, I, I suppose we just, we were in a position where I thought I could get another job if I really, really have to. I've got enough skills that it might not be a brilliant job, but, you know, but I would definitely, I would just take, take the risk. Um, I'm not saying take the leap and, you know, it's all be brilliant if you work hard. It, it doesn't always work out that way. But I would, you know, if, if you if you can live with your worst case scenario, then I would take the risk and um, have the confidence to go. And and I think have the confidence. I, mean, I think women lack more confidence um, in that. And consider that you maybe don't lack confidence, actually, and you're just quieter. And that's 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 fine. You know, you don't need to be a big showy front person. You know, there, there's plenty of um, plenty of um, people doing that. But but you if you've done your calculations worked out you can manage the cope with the worst case scenario and then just take the risk and, and go for it and um, yeah it it's it'll never be as bad as you think it's going to be and then um, plan 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 
yeah, lots of planning. Uh, lots of planning <laughs> what you're going to do, I think, as well, because it's really easy to miss things. I mean, even to this day, I frequently miss things um, if I don't plan. Uh, so, yeah, planning, take a, take a risk, um, be confident. But being confident doesn't mean that you have to be the loudest person in the room. Just, you know, quiet confidence is fine. Um, it's the, you know, quiet confidence and the knowledge and training that you have of, of your, you know, your skills of, as a teacher. You're the person that knows how to do it and, and just have faith in those skills as well. That's a lot of things. It's not five at all. So but <laughs> it's not, sorry, five things. Not five, but, um, I think it's, uh, yeah, no, so... Yeah, they're all pretty equal. You need you need to, yeah. I suppose you have to plan from the beginning to work out if you can, you know, take the risk. And then you're taking the, the business is based on your knowledge and skills, and you've got to have confidence that you've got done all those four things beforehand. That's slightly more ordered. <laughs> Brilliant. Um, okay, so we'll just <clears throat> I'm just conscious of how much time of, how much of your time I'm taking. So no, uh, we'll uh, we'll skip ahead a wee bit. Um, <clears throat> so in terms of TEFL teaching you've seen so much and of course mm -hmm. written and published so much of your own teaching material I have to ask is there or was there anything about the industry from a curricular perspective that really bothered you? Um, I think the, the reality is the curriculum is different in every country and it depends mm -hmm. on where you are, what exams people are aiming for, or what skill sets they're looking for. Because as, as I said, in Greece, they're really going for the exams. They would be going for the Cambridge exams, which were the traditional um, exams taken for years. Um, but they also switched, or while we were there, they also went for uh, Michigan exams, which is American exams, because American English became more important. The two skill sets that you need for the two exams are quite different. There's a lot of reading, talking, um, writing, and listening in Cambridge. So you've got four skills. But in Michigan, it was quite different. The, the exams were based on a lot of vocabulary knowledge. So they'd have a sentence, choice of four words, multiple choice, but these would be difficult, you know, depending on the level, but they would be really difficult words, for, you know, and, and becoming, you know, the higher and more proficient um, you're, you're heading up the scale, the more difficult it was, but this it's quite different things that you're teaching. So the Michigan was vaguely more the rote that maybe they were used to. Um, kids in Greece don't learn or didn't learn when we were there, so obviously could be different um, how to debate or, or to write a discursive essay and giving two sides because they would learn things much more by rote. And, um, so that's where it, it, and then even with, again, within Greece, you have the PALSO exams, which was um, Pan-Hellenic Association. So they were slightly different again. So there were faults in all, maybe that were different um, the response on all of them, it, you know, um, but it depended again, it would depend on your skills, but I certainly find the Cambridge books on the whole, they would have the, the ones that you could get in the UK, like Headway, which are, are big brands that we use throughout, you know, teaching world sort of thing. But they also had specific ones created in Greece by um, uh, publishing houses there for the Cambridge exams. But geared towards Greek kids. Problems with them was certainly once they were you going up to higher levels was that there was a lot of Greek in it. So it was it became more there was maybe too much of the translating, which is kind of what you do trying to take the kids away from is you're trying to get them to think. I suppose I, I'm not fluent in any languages, but the idea is that you're you're thinking in the language that you're talking in almost. Um, but if you've got the Greek um so it was it was becoming more about just passing the exams than having the skills that you would then go out into the world and use. So if you're using ones that were maybe fully English, th this is my opinion, so this might not be <laughs> <laughs> uh, what everybody else thinks within TEFL. Yeah, I think it, it's, you know, it's just different teaching methods, you know, what, what, what are the results you're wanting? Is that the kids need to get their proficiency exam because that gets them into, you know, 
X, Y, Z job or, or university course? Or do you want them to be able to go out into the world and be completely fluent well, in, in the language, you know, which might be a different set of skills, though they're both proficiency level skills. Um, so the curriculum, uh -huh. uh, yeah, I think, you know, it's the same when we're doing things, we, we create courses, so you think it's brilliant, you put it out and you get feedback and it's not <laughs> quite what, um, you know, it's not satisfying what you hoped it was satisfying and then so, but we 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 you know in this day and age we have the benefit we can you know when we have built our new courses we can put out parts of them to customers and get direct feedback back and we can change things easily. I certainly you know publishing books is is um, if it's if it's book led curriculum that can be harder and then you've also got teachers like me who could be completely out of date with the newest methodology and, and keep going, no, 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 the way I do it is best. I mean, sometimes we, we put new things and I say, oh, I don't think that's how, and like, no, no, this is, this is better than how you used to do it. So it's, yeah, it's, it's um, yeah, <laughs> everything changes and it's, you know, as we're saying, it was about you, you keep learning and accepting uh, things are different. Mm -hmm. um, so uh, to, wrap things up a bit to come to our conclusion um your career story to me at least is is you know there's a lot in there about fortitude about willingness to take on new challenges uh, and when challenges arrive going all out when those opportunities come um how would you describe your career as both a teacher and a businesswoman what what adjectives would you would you use to sum up everything so far if that's not too obtuse yeah no um i, I found teaching really fulfilling um, moving into an office job after teaching, I found much m quite difficult because n not so my, my first job was in the public sector. I was there for 10 years. But as a teacher, you generally got something nice happen every day. You know, somebody said something nice to you or something nice. Somebody did really well on a test or, or you got some baking brought in or, you know, it could be anything. But there was always something I thought. Um, that just brightened up your day, even if it was a rubbish day. The rest of the day could be rubbish, but um, it was quite. Fulf I found it quite fulfilling. Um, going into an office job was different then, so I think yeah, fulfilling definitely for the teaching. And um, yeah, it was exciting, and you were doing something different, and you know, and uh, you know, I was so glad when I came get back to the UK about thirty one. I hadn't gone straight from university and gone and got a job and got a mortgage and I'd just be stuck in that life because I wasn't enjoying it. <laughs> I went back at thirty and thought this is rubbish. Yeah. Um, so <laughs> I I I really appreciate that I did that in my twenties, um, and I think it gave me lots of skills that I I was able to take out with. Um, away from uh, teaching and use it elsewhere. Um, running the, the company, yeah, it's probably been about, um, it's been a lot a lot of learning. Um, again, come back to what I was using earlier, a lot of adaptability um, uh -huh. in taking hits and just having to pull, bring yourself back, you know, pull yourself back up and, and try not to take per things personally. And um, so it's quite, quite a lot of resilience. Um, but also, it, there's been a lot of excitement, you know, there's been a lot of opportunities, met, you know, amazing people, um, done lots of things, you know, ha had lots of opportunities I'd never have had if I'd stuck in my um, civil service job or even if I, you know, yeah, even, you know, I think it's, it's TEFL, sort of, so it's the TEFL two parts of the teaching and then the, the running the company has definitely given me lots of opportunities that I just wouldn't have had um, and experiences that I wouldn't have had. And I really enjoy it. You know, I have my, my eldest son's away abroad, living abroad. Um, you know, my daughter's finishing school. She's going to head off for a year. I think, you know, it's probably quite infectious if you've enjoyed it. But I do appreciate it's not for everyone. Uh, and I also, there are some horrific times um, when you can feel really alone and you're stuck. <laughs> But I think that also build, builds a real, you know, nobody's there to help you, your mum and dad aren't there. Um, you haven't phoned uh -huh. them for three weeks because we didn't have mobile phones, you've forgotten so you can't really ask for help because you've <laughs> ignored them for so long. <laughs> um, but I yeah. think, um, it is, so you have to be really, you, you do learn resilience, which I think then, yeah, fed into the company, 
because starting up a business is lonely. Um, you know, none of my friends did it. None of our friends were doing it. Um, I didn't know people in the same situation. You're making all the decisions as if you know what you're doing. You don't all the time. You know, sometimes sometimes you do. Um, but a lot of time it's, it's a learning experience for you, which comes back to you know I did a lot of you know once I was in the position where I was gonna be running the company was. Definitely, yeah, I need somebody to tell me what you're meant to do. So, you know, I'm not, yeah, reading accounts is still not my favourite thing. You know, they have to send them out early to me. So Can't blame you. Reading, because it takes me twice as long. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, numbers aren't, mm, yeah. So, yeah, <laughs> is that not your strong point either? <laughs> No, no, no. I can count, I can count to ten, but that's that's as far as I can, I yeah. can go. But um, I, I can, yeah, yeah. I can I can do the arithmetic. It's like once you start, but it's got a page of numbers. I mean, who, who wants to sit and look at that all day? Yeah. So you yeah, know, learning exactly. to delegate that was a good thing. It's a business. You know, <laughs> there's somebody that can do it better Absolutely. than you. Give it to them to do. <laughs> so, yeah, that would be one hundred percent thing if you're. <laughs> Yeah, it's, it's not my, not um, my lots of yeah. Knowing your strengths and weaknesses—that's another thing that probably has been a, a learning mm -hmm. curve. So finally, uh, if someone's listening to this or they're watching this and they're thinking, "This all sounds amazing," you know, I'd love to start my own business. I'd love to go abroad and and teach English, but they're just not quite sure yet. How would you? What What would you say to them? I think I've always I've always gone down the route of like, oh, well, this is a this is a sensible, safe option that could do that, and it'll probably be okay, it'll probably be fine, or this is the thing that really interests me and could be really exciting and much more exciting, and that's actually what I really what I really want to do. If I, if they took away the two options, which one would I be most sad at losing? So somebody said, right, you've got no chance of having that nice, safe thing. You've got to go with the other if that's what makes you happy. But if somebody says, oh, right. You've got no oh, you, the the nice exciting life that's gone. You don't how which one would you feel saddest about? I do that quite often. I'm buying things as well, but I really like that skirt. You know, if somebody say I really can't get it tomorrow. <laughs> yeah, no, no, you can't. That's okay. No, I'm not that bothered. Or, yeah, ice cream or whatever. But yeah, you know, just take the thing that excites you most. I think. I think, yeah, and I think it is possible. You know, I'm. My mum always wanted me to be a primary school teacher. I just couldn't face the thought, not because I didn't want to teach, but I was terrified to stand in front of people and teach. And then, um, but when it became standing in front of teaching people in Greece, it all of a sudden became a different, you know, I really wanted to do it. I wasn't any more confident, wasn't any more brave, but I really wanted to go and live that life. And um, so I'm, um, yeah, just force yourself to do it sometimes you can't but um, on the whole I think if you if it's something you really want you just need to go make yourself do it mm -hmm. well Jennifer Mackenzie thank you so much for coming onto the podcast um it's been really great chatting to you thanks for having me Ian. thank you you've been listening to I taught English abroad a podcast series by the TEFL Orc keep up to date with every episode, subscribe to us on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, or your streaming platform of choice. And we love feedback, so feel free to leave us a review on any platform you like. For more information about the TEFL Org, or about teaching English as a foreign language in general, head on over to tefl.org. That's T-E-F-L dot O-R-G. Thanks for listening, and we'll see you next time.